Good morning. I'd like to thank you for taking the choice to join us here at the Greenbrier Church Online. People that are my age will remember the excitement of waking up early on a Saturday morning, grabbing a bowl of your favorite cereal, and sitting down in front of the TV to watch cartoons. Our young people don't realize how fortunate they are today since they can watch cartoons anytime they want to and anywhere they can get a cell signal. But for people my age, cartoons were only shown during a five-hour stretch on Saturday mornings, and it was glorious. We got to watch The Pink Panther and Woody Woodpecker, The Flintstones and Scooby-Doo, Super Friends and Thundercats, The Smurfs and He-Man and Voltron. Those cartoons fueled our imaginations as we played in the afternoons recreating what we saw on TV. They dictated what we were on Halloween. And while everybody seemed to have cartoons that they loved and cartoons that they hated, in my neighborhood, for 60 minutes every Saturday, every home was tuned in to Looney Tunes. Every Saturday, we got to watch Sylvester try to catch Tweety while Wiley E. Coyote tried to catch the Roadrunner, only to fail in a spectacular fashion. We saw Daffy Duck going round and round with Elmer Fudd or Yosemite Sam taking his best shot at Bugs Bunny. All the time, Porky Pig was reminding us, that's all, folks. There were also those guys that you got to see on on occasion, like the Foghorn Leghorn or Pepe Le Pew or the Tasmanian Devil. And then there was Marvin the Martian. Marvin the Martian was created to be the opposite of Yosemite Sam. He was quiet and calm, polite, soft-spoken. Most of the time, he would be facing off against Bugs Bunny or Duck Dodgers in his flying saucer with his trusty sidekick, K-9. He wanted to take over the world or destroy the planet. The opening was awfully predictable, even for a five-year-old. Marvin would come to the earth, and he would demand that the first thing that he saw, take me to your leader, which is apparently the protocol if you're going to take over a planet. The funny thing was that he often talked to inanimate objects, like a fire hydrant or a parking meter. And he would say, take me to your leader, and get frustrated that they wouldn't respond. Marvin was in less than 10 episodes, yet everybody seems to remember him because, well, probably there's a little bit of Marvin in each and every one of us. We all are searching for someone who has authority and power, somebody worth following. Even in our postmodern, hyper-individualistic culture, everybody is searching for someone to follow. The only thing that we want to know is, are they worth following? Just like Marvin, we're all asking for someone, anyone, to take us to their leader. I'm starting this morning with a small assumption that you're either a follower of Christ or you're searching to see if Jesus is actually worth following. Regardless of whether you believe in God or not, you have to admit that Jesus holds a huge influence in our world. Jesus is the most influential person who ever lived. I can't think of a single person who's been studied and examined more than Jesus Christ. There have been more books written about Jesus, more songs sung about Jesus, more home decorations depicting Jesus or his teachings than anyone else in all of history. You might think that after 2,000 years of interest in Christ that we'd have him all figured out but you'd be wrong. You see, we tend to live with this idea that we all see Jesus the same, and that's not exactly true. We all come to Jesus with some preconceived ideas which largely influence what we're looking for. Some of us see Jesus as a God of rage who's waiting for us to make a mistake so that he can punish us. Sinners in the hand of an angry God. Others see Jesus as a blonde-haired, blue-eyed man who just walks around holding a lamb without the power to do much of anything. And others see Jesus as a man who's so overcome with love, he's just going to allow us to do whatever, whenever, wherever. It's hard to introduce people to Jesus if you don't really know who he is. And that's not a new problem. All throughout the Gospels, we find that people struggled with Jesus because they didn't really know who he was. This morning, I want us to look at five different passages that center around the question, 
Who is Jesus? I think if we're going to claim that Jesus is our Lord and leader, we've got to know, is He worthy of our devotion? In Luke chapter 5, we find Jesus teaching in a home, and word has spread that Jesus is there. Crowds begin to fill the house to the point that nobody can get in. A small group of men show up thinking that if they could get their paralyzed friend to Jesus, that Jesus would heal him. I mean, there's already stories going around that Jesus has the ability to heal the sick. It's a no-brainer to take our sick friend to see him. But can you imagine the disappointment they must have felt when they got there just to see that Jesus is in the middle of the house and there's no way to get into seeing because everybody's crowding and pressing against him? It's not like the Pharisees or religious teachers are going to give up their seat for this group of men and their sick friend. As a matter of fact, they believe that the reason this man was diseased and disabled is because he was paying a penalty for the sin in his life. So these men do some creative thinking. I mean, they would carried their friend all of this way. They're not about to give up so easy. So what they decide to do is climb this staircase on the outside of the house up to the top of the roof. They located the ceiling directly above where Jesus was, and they started to pull up the roof and the tiles. As Jesus is down there teaching, sand and dust begin to trickle down onto his tunic, and within a few moments, this stretcher descends. Ever since the paralytic had heard of this miraculous man from Nazareth, he dreamed of hearing the words, Arise, take up your pallet, and walk. But that's not what Jesus says. Jesus says something entirely different. We read his outrageous words in verse 20 where he says, Friend, your sins are forgiven. Well, of course, the teachers of the law and the Pharisees understood exactly what Jesus was claiming. You can hear it in their response. The legal experts and the Pharisees began to murmur among themselves, Who is this who insults God? Only God can forgive sins. They knew enough to come and to listen to Jesus teach, but they didn't know him. Flip over a couple pages to Luke 7, and you find that Jesus has already healed the servant of a centurion as well as brought a widow's only son back to life. People are talking about Jesus and all of the wonderful miracles and teaching. So is it really a surprise that a Pharisee would invite Jesus to his home to have a meal so that they can get a good look at this new rabbi who's attracting such a large following? Once again, the house is packed with religious leaders who are reclining at the table, eating and talking and listening to Jesus. It seems, though, that there are other people in the house as well. Culture dictated that uninvited guests are allowed to go and to sit against the walls and to listen in on the dinner conversation. They're uninvited. They can listen but not talk. And definitely they're not to approach the table or get involved. But that day there's this woman in the room who breaks every bit of protocol. As Jesus reclines at the table, she creeps forward and she falls at his feet. She, she's crying so much that she's able to wash his feet with her tears. And then in a beautiful act of worship, she pours this entire container of expensive perfume on his feet. Once again, Jesus is looking at this person at his feet and he says, Your sins have been forgiven. And even though Jesus is in a different city, in a different house, the reaction is very much the same. The religious authorities, the one who knew the prophecies about the coming Messiah, the men who should have been looking for Jesus to come, still have to ask, who is this man? That he goes around forgiving sin. They'd seen him, they'd heard him, but they didn't know him. You might understand how the Pharisees and the teachers of the law would struggle with their understanding of who Jesus was. But in Mark's gospel, we find that even his closest companions had no idea who Jesus really was. In Mark chapter 4, we find that his disciples are confused about Jesus, and they were for most of his ministry. They had seen a number of miraculous healings. They had seen people raised from the dead. They ate the bread and the fish when Jesus fed the 5,000. They heard scores of sermons and lessons, and yet they're still not really sure. I mean, they would readily admit that Jesus was special. They just failed to understand who he really was. 
And Jesus had spent the day teaching the crowds. And when evening came, he told his disciples, let's get in the boat and go to the other side. So they leave the crowd and they start out across the lake when out of nowhere this huge storm comes up and begins to rock the boat and waves are splashing in and the boat is rocking back and forth to the point that it's about to sink. And these fishermen turned disciples are scared to death. During all the commotion, Jesus is asleep in the back of the boat. His disciples go and wake him up saying, Teacher, teacher, don't you care that we're about to drown? The Bible says that Jesus gets up and simply orders the wind and the waves to be still. And the greatest part of that story to me is not that the wind dies down a little, not that the storm becomes manageable for them to get across. Rather, we're told that the wind stops completely. Everything is calm. The waves disappear. The lake is like smooth glass. Is it any wonder that in verse 41, these men who had walked eaten, and even slept in the same places that Jesus had, had to ask, who is this man? Even the wind and the waves obeyed. These men had been with Jesus. They knew things about him. They knew that he was different. They just didn't know him. I would imagine if you had given them a pop quiz or they were watching Jeopardy about the things that Jesus had done or the miracles he had performed or things that he had said, they probably would have done a pretty good job, maybe even gotten the daily double. But in a moment of crisis, they told the truth of what they really thought and knew about Jesus. Maybe you've noticed that in your own life. It's one thing to go to a building and sing, How Great Thou Art, or How Great Is Our God, only to leave and continue to struggle with doubt and insecurity. You can sing, There's Power in the Blood, and still fight with the guilt and shame of your everyday life. Just because you know about Jesus doesn't mean that you know Jesus. As a matter of fact, when Jesus shows us His love and His compassion, oftentimes we're caught off guard because much like the disciples, we don't know who Jesus is. Okay, flip over to another text in Mark's Gospel. This one's in Mark chapter 6. Here we see that Jesus goes back to his hometown, and on the Sabbath day, when everybody is gathering to worship God, Jesus gets up and reads from the prophet and begins to teach. The people of his hometown hear him, and they begin to ask, where did he get all this wisdom and the power to perform such miracles? They scoff. He's just a carpenter, the son of Mary, the brother of James, Joseph, Judas, and Simon, and his sisters, they live right here among us. They were deeply offended and refused to believe in him. Nazareth was a small town and everybody knew everybody. The town was filled with people that knew Jesus. They knew his parents, they knew his brothers, they knew his sisters. They saw Jesus grow up. They saw him participate in the synagogue and in those customary rites of passage. And yet as his reputation grew, I'm sure there were town folks who snickered and and laughed at those absurd rumors. After all, they knew him back when. But when they discover the rumors to be true, that his power is genuine, they they still don't believe. Even the people that watched Jesus grow up had to ask, who is this man? It seems that every day people questioned who Jesus was, so it shouldn't surprise us that we meet people every day who are skeptical about Jesus and his claim to be the Son of God. I'm sure there are people watching this video that are not quite sure what to do with Jesus. There are folks who've heard about Jesus, but they have a little time or interest in knowing who he really is. Other people think, you know, Jesus is a neat idea. He's a great teacher. They're just reluctant to admit that he's anything more than a man. He's definitely not the Messiah. There are even folks that went to a church building today that are not that far removed from the people in the pages of our Bible. They encounter him in houses and synagogues and dinner parties. And while they have to be honest enough to admit that Jesus is not ordinary, they're not ready to call him their Messiah or their leader. Okay, one last text this morning. We're going to look at Matthew chapter 16. In this text, we find that Jesus is drawing his ministry to an end. He's aware that there's still all of this confusion and and questions about who he really is. So 
in the text, Jesus is talking with his disciples and he asks them a very important question. Starting in verse 13, we read, When Jesus came to the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do people say that the Son of Man is? Well, they replied, some say John the Baptist, and some say Elijah, and others say Jeremiah or one of the other prophets. Then he asked them, But who do you say that I am? Everybody agreed there was something special about Jesus. Everybody seemed to have their own theory, though, about what made him special. Maybe he was John the baptizer back from the dead, or maybe he was a prophet of old who's returned from the dead to announce the revival of Israel. There are lots of opinions, but nobody seems to think that Jesus is the Messiah. And after spending a considerable amount of time with his disciples, Jesus just simply asks them, Who do you say that I am? Jesus' question was direct. And in my mind, as I read the passage, I see his disciples hesitating, probably squirming a little bit. You know, it's one thing to have a thought about something. It's something completely different to say that thought out loud. And yet that's exactly what Peter does. Peter blurts out, you are the Messiah, the Son of the living God. Don't miss what Peter's claiming here. When he called Jesus the Messiah, he was saying that Jesus was the fulfillment of the promise of God that God made to Abraham. He's the Savior that's promised through the line of King David. Peter's saying that Jesus shares all of God's qualities, privileges, and power. That's why Jesus is just as worthy of worship as our Father God is. The the same Father that the Jews had worshipped in the temple for centuries. If the other disciples didn't agree with what Peter was saying, they had a responsibility to drag Peter in front of the authorities as a blasphemer and have him stoned. But they don't object, and neither does Jesus. Actually, Jesus praises Peter, saying, You were blessed, Simon, son of John, because my Father in heaven has revealed this to you. Jesus says, Peter, you've got it. I am, in fact, God. Now notice, Jesus doesn't claim to be a great teacher. He doesn't claim to be a good man. He claims to be the promised Messiah, to be God. And this morning, you're being called to answer the same question. Who do you say Jesus is? Do you just claim that he's a good man, or a great teacher, or the Messiah, Savior, and Redeemer of the world? Our history books are filled with the names of some pretty influential people. Alexander the Great, Caesar Augustus, Constantine, they all conquered vast stretches of the known world. Plato, Newton, Einstein revolutionized the way that humankind thinks. There are more than a handful of musicians, composers, philosophers, builders, and world leaders who impacted the world in a positive way. Each of these men and women have won more wars, they've written more works of art, they've traveled farther than Jesus ever did. Yet there's never been a single person who impacted the world more profoundly, permanently, or personally than that lowly carpenter from Nazareth. This morning as we make our way to the tables, we're being asked to answer the question, who is Jesus in your life? We're either going to accept him or reject him. And our decision is not just made with our mouths. Our decision is made by the way we live our lives. I first came across this trilemma when I read Mere Christianity by C.S. Lewis, only to come across it again in the writings of John Duncan and the writings of Watchman Nee. The trilemma is basically a problem with three and only three different answers. And we're forced to choose one of those three. So here's the trilemma. Since Jesus claimed to be God, we must place him in one of three categories. Christ either deceived mankind by conscious fraud, or he was a madman who was deluded or self-deceived, or he is the divine Messiah. As this morning, as we go to the table to take the bread and the cup, we're being forced to choose one of those three possibilities. If you don't believe that Jesus is actually God, then you have to decide, was he a liar or a lunatic? 
You can't simply claim that Jesus was a good man or a moral man who claimed to be God. If he made that claim and he's not God, he's a liar or a lunatic. Or is he the Messiah? He can't be both. Your answer to that question is seen in the way that you live your life. There's no room in God's kingdom for people that are partially committed to his lordship. God calls us to leave everything else behind and to give him our very lives. And he makes that demand because he has already laid down his life for you. That's what we declare. More importantly, that's what we celebrate when we go to the table. So this morning, as you take the bread and you take the cup, you have to decide, is Jesus a liar? Is Jesus a madman? Or is Jesus the Lord and Savior, the Messiah, the reigning King? But you also have to answer that question on Monday, and on Tuesday, and on Wednesday, and every day of your life. The way that you live your life, the choices that you make, the way that you show mercy, that you show grace, that you welcome people in, that you show people forgiveness, all of that is dictated off how you see Jesus. You see, we live in a community where people are clamoring and asking, take me to your leader, take me to your leader. The question you have to answer as you go to the table this morning is, do you know who your leader is? I hope you have a wonderful time of discussion around the table. It's my hope and my prayer this week that we will all come to a better understanding, that we will get invested, truly invested in figuring out who is this man. So that when somebody asks us, Why do we follow Jesus? Why do we claim to be a child of God? Or who is Jesus? That we can tell them that we believe without a doubt in our mind that He is our Lord, Savior, and Messiah. I hope you have a great week. Always remember that you're loved. And I look forward to seeing you very soon. Please go in peace.